everyone thinking about how uh, you know the technology in our pocket has developed how have mobile phones i'm not sure you can see that there we go with my uh background uh, how has mobile phone technology enabled uh you know non-scientists to get involved you mentioned citizen science earlier on so how can non-scientists students teachers people that are interested start to get involved in thinking about science and biodiversity using you know the technology in our pockets I can start that one too because I mentioned iNaturalists, which is my favorite for that. So there's a global, there's something called GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Infrastructure, place to look at what museum records are out there. But also, if you use iNaturalists, which is a free program that you can download on your phone, you can take a picture of an organism. You don't have to know the name of it. You know, it'll it'll give you a a, a potential ID, and then other experts will check it, and that will go to that global biodiversity infrastructure. So you can. As a citizen, as a non-trained scientist, you can, you know, add and contribute to our knowledge of, of biodiversity. You can also, uh, well, I'll let the other panelists speak about other technologies that are available, but that's my favorite. Zeta, is there anything you recommend for people connecting with their natural environment, with their technologies around them? Oh, well, I, I also use iNaturalist all the time. I'm uh, frequently out around um, hiking and taking pictures of the plants. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm a full advocate of that. Um, with regards um, eDNA stuff in particular, there are a couple of um, global initiatives coming out. Um, I think uh, uh, I, uh, e Geo Atlas. I can't remember, I'll write it in the chat, um, but lots of different um, local kind of uh, system science projects where people can take eDNA samples and then um, submit them for analysis and to help with the growing kind of uh, biodiversity monitoring um, at local scale. So uh, there's lots of opportunities to be involved in this kind of um, technology nowadays. So yeah, it would be um, really good to, to have people on the ground kind of taking these samples because I think like boots on the ground is what matters and um if we're not we if we're able unable to get these samples and unable to get to these places then we won't won't know what's happening in these places and so we need the samples and we need people to be out there kind of doing their bit as well and i'm guessing Sahid, I'm going to put this one over to you because it's a genetics based one. This has come from Daniel Trenchke, who's one of our amazing student debaters this year. What do you think is most interesting about research in genetics and evolution? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the, the, the most interesting part of the research in genetics is that uh, it helps a lot to, uh, to, to demarcate the taxonomical boundaries among the species. And also, it helps a lot to understand the, uh, what, what we call the ecosystem uh, demarcation for the species. And also, it, it's, it's also very interesting to, to detect what are the controversies that have been, uh, that have been happening at the local or conventional uh, technology that is uh, hidden to be, to be understood by man over years. And the, the TNA technology has been helping so fantastically to correct most of this very uh, misinformation and also uh, effort to, to re-identify and to harmonize data uh, along the understanding of uh, okay, the species, the, okay, uh, the plants, the animals, the population, the uh, endangered, the threatening, and also uh, uh, the conservation uh, strategies and status. Yeah. Thank you. How about you, Prasanta? What for you is the most interesting thing about genetic and evolutionary research? For me, it comes down to like the biggest philosophical philosophical questions that we have. Who am I? Where are we from? And we're from other species. And if you look at the tree of life that Saeed's building, that Rosetta's helping us build, you know, we can look at where we fit on the tree of life. You know, and the more species we know about, the more we can say, oh, okay, we're on the vertebrate part of the tree of life, the mammal part of the tree of life. And, you know, the vertebrates came from this group of invertebrates. And, and where, you know, why are, our, why do our hands have five fingers, you know, instead of 10, like the first animals that came onto land. So 
Um, for me, the most interesting part is building that tree of life because that really is a map of, of our origins and our history. Great, thank you. How about you, Rosetta? I guess I'm kind of interested in adaption and how things are changing and how, uh, as the environment changes, how do species persist and how they kind of adapt. That's my kind of interest, uh, particularly uh, with uh, drought and how do species in rivers, are they able to adapt and have uh, drought resistant egg forms and things like that? How, how, how does that work and, and how, how how are, how are species successful in adapting to climate change? I think is um, my kind of interest. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. appreciates and understands enough about the invisible species we can't see um, and do you think that indigenous heritage uh, are more aware perhaps than western science about their biodiversity who wants to go with that one some great questions coming through guys <laughs> i'll take the invisible species as um uh, work i've been doing recently on, on kind of bacteria and things like um the species that less uh, charismatic megafauna, so to speak. So um, kind of the, the, the bacteria and the fungi that, that we, we can now uh, look at and, and, and see the, the change in, in, in the communities within in river systems in particular. Uh, we previously haven't uh, used that information to, to study what's happening in our, in our rivers. Like what, again, what, what human pressures are, are kind of having, having an impact on, on the river. So, uh, I don't think at the moment we we fully appreciate that and, and, and now new tools are opening up how we can possibly uh, now try to understand and try to try to look at kind of the effects on these kind of invisible species that we haven't haven't looked at before because we've maybe concentrated on the insects or the plants or the fish or things like that so yeah I think new tools are, are really um, opening up possible avenues of, of studying these new invisible species but yeah previously maybe not so much yeah so the trust for sustainable living runs a visitor center which is a rainforest uh, an indoor rainforest in the uk and one of the things that we try and teach the students about is mycorrhizal fungi and their importance within forest ecosystems so they're almost an underground or in the forest actually they can be above ground as well in the canopy layers a uh, layer of fungi that connects everything all of the plants all of the trees everything is connected by this amazing web of fungi that pass nutrients and send chemical messages and scientists are just beginning to understand now the importance of that but they really think that that's the kind of keystone foundation of having a healthy forest ecosystem is this tiny tiny little mycorrhizal fungi that form these enormous networks that cover the whole forest so it's yeah i think invisible species are undervalued prasanta or uh, sahid have you got any thoughts about that or do you want to think about indigenous people and whether their knowledge is uh, perhaps or more aware of western than western science I'm not sure if Saeed may be frozen there, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. So yeah, absolutely indigenous people um, know the local habitat and local fauna better. There's something I call the, the dinner data principle. You know, if I, the, the animals that I'm looking for that people collect for dinner, you know, will they will know those organisms, you know, a thousand times better than me trying to collect the data. You know, they just, you have to work with local people um, to be, have a better understanding of the environment. And we're lo losing not just species, but indigenous cultures, um, you know, altogether. So, um, you know, part of uh, doing science is, is also connecting with the local people. And, and it's becoming harder and harder to do uh, that because of that disconnect. So we need to do a better job there. Okay, thank you.